go. Excellent. So hopefully you'll have just press your button on your screen. And I'd like to say good evening to everybody. So um, my name is Stuart Wall. I'm, I'm a regional organiser for the Royal Photographic Society, um, covering the East Midlands and the um, Central Region, and also one of the um, chairs of the new photo book distinction. And with me tonight, I've also got Richard Hall, who's one of the assessors, Joe Teasdale, who's one of the assessors, and Marianthe. Where have you gone, Marianthe? There we are, Marianthe Lanus or Lanas. You'll have to tell me how to pronounce that at one point, Marianthe. So we're all going to um, get involved this evening. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, please do ask them. There will be a section at the end for questions. And during the actual presentation, if you think of anything, just pop them into the chat room as well. But I would like you to be involved. So in that last section, please do um, come on and switch your mic on and talk about your questions. So I'm just going to change the view there. So let's go to that. There we go. And then I'm going to share my screen. So you should be looking, hopefully, now at the, the um, photo books. Let's go, oops, sorry. The photo books intro screen. Is that what you're looking at? If somebody can just confirm that for me, please. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. So, yeah, so Thursday, January the 27th. I'm sorry we had to rearrange um, the event. And thank you for joining us this evening. We've got a good attendance, so thank you very much. And what we hope to do tonight is give you an idea of why the photo book genre is a little bit different to the other genres and also discuss kind of what makes a photo book and how that is different to a photo album of photographs. So these are the things that we're going to be discussing. We can't give you every um, answer tonight because it is quite a big um, subject. So um, what we're going to do is in a moment, I'm going to, uh, we're going to meet the assessors um, because I think it's always important to know who is assessing your work and where they're from, what their backgrounds are and what their interests are. We're going to investigate the RPS website where the photo book resources are. And I really urge you to download those resources and really study them carefully because there's a lot of information in there. Um, we're going to look at the three different distinction levels and also we're going to look at what is a photo book. And in that what is a photo book, we're going to look at narrative, we're going to look at sequencing, typography, and we're also going to look at some successful or a successful photo book application. And then at the end, we're going to look at the audience questions. So these are the um, guidelines. These are the, this is the page on the website, and we'll be looking at that in more detail after we've met the assessors. So this is the team, if you like. We are looking for another couple of members at the moment. Um, but the way that we put the team together was we, we picked um, or invited, I should say, invited people to join who had a different skill set. So obviously photo books could be digital printed, they could be handmade books. Um, Tim is a researcher um, and also teaches, as you know, some of you will know. Um, so we've, we've got a nice rounded team so that whatever comes to us, there will be somebody <coughs> with expert knowledge in that area. Um, so, Trevor can't be with us this evening, unfortunately, um, but Trevor is based in Scotland. Um, he's fourth generation photographer, and his specialism is um, professional photography in portraits and weddings. Um, very, very accomplished photographer, and he, he also moves in many of the different societies. So a great asset to the RPS, and he really brings some strong ideas um, and is really enthusiastic about this concept of photo books, as we, as we all are. So that's Trevor, and that's his website, beautiful website, and it's well worth looking at some of Trevor's photographs. He also sits on the applied panel, the applied panel having once been called professional and applied. 
So two different panels there. Marianthi, um, I'm going to play you a little video in a moment, but Marianthi, can, can I ask you to switch your mic on and, and just tell me why you engage with photo books, please? Um, yes, I um, became interested in photo books. Um, I mean, as a, as a sort of um, a collector or a sort of viewer of photo books, sort of quite a number of years ago, 15 or so years ago. But in terms of actually producing them myself, since around sort of 2016 or so, when um, hitting a bit of a creative crisis, felt the real need to um, get my images off the hard drive, was working in series more, wanted to do something more hands on, literally sort of hands on. So I have a particular interest not just in photo books but in the handmade aspect of photo books the materiality if you like all of those um, the different things that, that the format the binding the papers um, that can be um, sort of used in your photo books I have a particular interest in that and, and maybe a particular skill hopefully um, so maybe about sort of you know five or six years experience of making and then um, a number of years prior to that of actually being a viewer and a collector of photo books Fantastic, Marianne. And I think I probably um, met you around about 2015, 2016. So it was maybe 2016 when we were both exhibiting at Saltaire. In yes. The Trail. <laughs> it was a long time ago now. It was. Um, and, and I think then you were predominantly digital um, photo book maker. Um, and then the next time I saw you, you'd moved into these handmade books in a big way. So I think the, the sort of curve over the last five or six years that you've traveled is absolutely fantastic. And I'm just gonna play a little video, if I may, from your website, Marianne, because I, I just really love the, um, in fact, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment because I forgot to click the sound button and the sound is really um, quite amazing on this little book. So. Uh, I'd forgotten I'd put any sound on that one. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. So we just scroll down onto it. And... <laughs> and what you'll see with Naranthi's book here is it's handmade, of course. Um, it's beautifully hinged, it's open, it's in the pages, and little separating pages that are beautiful. And obviously, you're really into your seascapes and Iceland in this occasion. Look at you turning over these pages. You've got the map, so you've set the context, you explain what you're looking to do, and then you go into these beautiful photographs. What sort of size is this book, Marianne? Sorry, what did you say, Stuart? What size is the book? Um, I think it's about a 20 by 20 inch um, book. It was the first one that I made. And in, in hindsight, I kind of wanted something quite large because that's um, sort of having some impact. In <coughs> hindsight, I would probably make it slightly smaller um, just for, it, it, you know, if I was to make it again, as it were, just for ease of printing and the cost of the paper, et cetera, et cetera. But it does work well at that size. It's probably the maximum that I could... Um, you know, sort of make it as it wouldn't go any larger with it. Thank you. And as, as we look through there, you can see that Marianthia dropped in some dividing tissues and, and there was a page that opened out. Um, so it interrupted and created a really interesting flow. So thank you, Marianthi. Thanks um, for sharing that, Stuart. No problem at all. Now, Joe, if I could ask you to switch your microphone on and answer the same question, please. What, what makes you engage with photo books? What is your interest in them? Okay, so uh, it happened after I did my uh, fellowship and getting ready for uh, the exhibition that is actually out of date, but advertised it very nicely, thank you. Um, so I, I got into photo book making because it, it fit the project that I was doing on my adopted family. And as Marianthi said, it's about using my photographs in a, a more hands-on way. So I created my own family album and it's all about the printing, the choice of paper. And for me, the uh, experience that you give somebody as they look through the book. And then it snowballed from there and what I don't like to, to, to make are empty books because um, artist books are also a part of what I do as well. But I don't like to make empty books because they'll just sit on my shelf doing nothing. 
So I have to wait for the perfect project to come along that lends itself to being put into a book. And I really enjoy the whole process of thinking about the size, the paper, the binding, very similar to, as uh, Marianthi mentioned, it's the whole experience that you're giving the, the viewer and the, the wealth of the variety, it, it, it's quite overwhelming actually, but to actually, um, to actually put it together is a really wonderful experience. And, and I've just got completely hooked, to, hooked on it. So they're both artist books that I, I make and, um, and also photographic books as well, which uh, I love so much because it's telling the story that I want to portray. Fantastic, Joe. Thank you. So there's there's a great saying in golf and sports, you know, don't forget to smell the roses. And that's what you're doing. You're really enjoying the process as you're creating the work. And, and you can see that Joe um, has a really marvellous website here where she's looking at many different things, um, street photography, <laughs> portraiture, and this idea of family. So that is fantastic, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, let me come on to Richard. So Richard um, is, is um, well, you, you tell us, Richard, if you, if you can speak with your microphone on, why do yeah. you like photo books? Well, I came across photo books by accident, really. I, I made a project in the first lockdown where I photographed. Richard, you've got your video up at the moment. I don't know whether you could switch it. Yeah, yeah okay. sorry. Sorry, I made my first photo book by accident, really. I, I photographed 178 families in the village during the first lockdown. Um, and I, I just outputted the work digitally. I shared it on Instagram and Flickr and Facebook, but the local council contacted me and said that they were going to make a book of my images, um, which I wasn't ever so impressed with. And I thought the way to stop them doing it was to make one myself. And you kindly edited that. And I, I got a, um, an associate in contemporary photography for that, um, but then went on to make a photo po poetry project uh, with a local... Can I just interrupt you for a moment? Can I ask everybody else to mute the microphone, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Carry so on, Richard. At the time, I was at the university doing a bachelor's degree in photography, and I went on to make... Uh, a second book of photo poetry with a local poet and actress author. Um, and that book got me a fellowship in contemporary photography. And I'm currently um, mainly engaged with theatre and dance, as you can see. And I'm working on a, the Hunchback of Notre Dame at Lincoln Cathedral. And for that, for my master's degree, I'm going to make two more books. One will be a book for the cast and another, the second book will be a much more edited version. And I've been approached by a South Korean graphic designer to work in collaboration to produce that book. And I just enjoy the, the, the sequencing, editing, um, and the, the rhythm of making books, really, the narrative of making books. And the, I mean, lastly, the, the images that I made for the, for the lockdown project, you know, when I drop off the end, and, and no one's playing for Flickr anymore. The, the images will disappear, but I sold 200 copies of that book. So hopefully there will, there will be a copy of that book somewhere and you know, they will, that, that'll give, give, give the, work, the work a longer life, really. Because that, that's a really positive uh, comment about the books, they last forever. And of course, we don't know what happens with our digital um, images. So it's almost like making prints when you're doing that physical book. Richard mentioned that he'd used books for um, his associate in his fellowship in contemporary. And of course you can do that. Um, it's just that in the other genres, the assessors are mainly looking at the photographs and the book is the vehicle, the, what you're putting the photographs in and it's, it's <coughs> mounts. Robert, I don't know if you could mute, could you, Robert? Would that be possible? Oh, There's sorry. A... That's okay. Thank you very much. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, 
And, um, and that's the difference really, because with the photo book genre, everything in that book is part of the assessment. And we will talk about that as we go through this presentation this evening. So thank you, Richard. Um, so Tim Daly has recently joined the panel um, and, and Tim um, gained his PhD um, by, by looking at photo books and things around photo books. It was really a really fascinating um, dissertation. You can download it from the British Library. It's well worth doing that. It's a long dissertation, of course, but there's some really interesting things in there. And Joe mentioned this experience and Tim talks about this in his, his, his PhD paper, the, the experience of looking at a photo book, everything adds to that experience. Just like if you went to the opera in real life, rather than looking at it on the television, the smell of the furniture, the lighting, the building around you as you enter into the building, everything adds to the experience of watching the opera. That's how a photo book, a good photo book, works. So Tim can't be with us tonight because he is teaching, um, but I think he's going to make a real strong addition to the team. And, and then I think that leaves, yep, that leaves me. So um, my background is professional photography. I started off as a press photographer in 1978, and I was still at school when I started on the newspaper. But one of the first jobs that I did was to photograph Enoch Powell at Archer Hall in Billericay. And I'd got an O-level in government politics, but I was totally confused by all that was going on. And that really started to interest me about how politics disrupts community life. And now, what is it, 42 years later, I'm doing a PhD, a professional doctorate, where I'm looking at how documentary photography and photo books as a form of disse disseminating the work can be used to look at a space and place and how that is used to develop community resilience. Resilience against political decisions and also new technology. So that's, that's where I come in and photo books, well I've used photo books or some form of photo books forever really, starting off with photo albums, but I wouldn't call that photo books where I was putting in wedding photographs maybe um, but then as time developed, I started using them more for disseminating stories, just as we used to do on the newspaper. So in many ways, I see photo books with a good um, approach as almost having your own newspaper. And of course, we can all print photo books quite easily. So that's, that's kind of like the team. And as I hope you can see, we all have different skill sets, but we're all very passionate about photo books. So that looks a bit complicated, that screen, doesn't it? Well, I guess the website can be a bit complicated at times, but this is how you can get straight through to the resources. And if you, if you put in rps.org and go to the main website, click on qualifications, scroll down the page, you then come to this box here, which says photo books distinction press on learn more and you then go to the, the um, page for photo books. So it's three clicks really and you're there. And we're gonna go there in a moment and actually go live on the website, hopefully. Fingers crossed that the website is live. It's, it's been pretty stable recently, so we've been okay. And we'll have a look at where these documents all are. So let's go there now. Yep, straight to it, brilliant, working very fast. And this is what you'll originally see. You'll see this at the top of the screen. And as we scroll down, you'll see the panel members who I've just introduced to you. Scroll down a little bit more and the contact details. That's all there is on the page. It's not very complicated, is it? But you can download the documents and that's what we're gonna do now. Just before we do that, the date of the next assessment is the 11th and 12th of April. You need to get your stuff in by the 21st of March if you want to meet that assessment date. So that's only, what, two months away. And then the next one is in October. The October one, you'll hear me talk briefly about BOP, probably BOP 22, I guess it is. Um, last year's was the day before BOP 21. And that is a fantastic photo book, exhibition, 
it's all over the paintworks. Martin Parr's involved. You'll see everybody, all the main players in the photo book production. And it really is a fantastic event. If you can get there, please do. And if you can't get there, try and get to another photo book exhibition. You'll see such a fantastic collection of photo books. I'm going to click on that. And if everything works OK, you should see that turn blue in the top right hand corner because this is going to download the guidelines. There it comes. It's just downloading now. And then we'll go to it and we'll just have a look at it. Brilliant. So let's just take that down. It's only six pages long. And the reason why there isn't loads of information is because what we've tried to do is put control of your creative approach to your work into your hands but there are some differences so let's go through them i'm just going to make that a little bit larger for you just scroll down so we've got an introduction and then the three different levels licentiate associate and fellowship we were talking about cameras with a magic viewfinder earlier on there's there's one there so all elements will be considered that make your photo book project from the images to the cover of the text. What form of photo book you present is under your creative control. Now there are lots of different ways you can create photo books. It can be digital printing, it can be softback digital, hardback digital. You could make your own photo book. Zines is all part of the photo book world. I mean, zines were something that emerged in the 70s. Students were making them to make political statements. If your project is political, then maybe a zine would be the way to go. Um, whatever you feel is appropriate to your project is what you should go for. Um, concertina books, of course, absolutely beautiful. If you're making handmade books, one copy is acceptable. Um, we would hope normally to have at least two copies. You can send a maximum of eight copies if you wish. Um, but two copies is ideal if they're digital, one. But if you've got any issues over there, just phone the Distinctions staff up or email them. Talk to Andy Moore or Ben or Simon. They're very accommodating and they will try to work around you. So don't panic if what's being asked there doesn't quite work out for you. Still talk to them. Now, to make, to make it so that it could still be identifiable with the current genres, um, licentiate, associate, fellowship, your book needs these minimums. So if you're submitting for a licentiate, it's a minimum of 10 images. Associate, a minimum of 15. Fellowship, a minimum of 20. Now, a little hint on there. The other difference is that if you apply for a licentiate, and the assessors feel that you've not only met the licentiate expectations, but also you've created a body of work which meets the associate expectations, you could be offered an associate. You don't have to take it if you don't want to, but you could be offered it. But only if you've got 15 images in. We wouldn't be able to offer an associate to somebody who'd apply for a licentiate if there's only 11 images. Likewise with fellowship, if you'd gone for a licentiate or associate and the assessors felt that your work was deserved of a fellowship, you could be offered a fellowship. Again, you don't have to take it if you don't want to, but again, you would need that minimum of 20 images. So just bear that in mind. We don't have a statement of intent. As you know, as some of you will know with the other genres, normally you're asked for a statement of intent with a maximum of 150 words, unless it's for contemporary, which is 300 words, but here we've done away with that and you can put in supporting evidence. Now that gives you a lot of creative control, but it also panics people um, and they're wondering, well, what goes into supporting evidence? And that's what something we can talk about in one-to-ones or in advisories or, or on the Facebook group, but it's really for you to discuss your project. Um, we're not really interested in whether you've used a Nikon or a Canon or Olympus, but if you've used it for a particular purpose, we might well be. So if you felt that the only way that you could make your work was with a specific type of, type of camera, mention it. We had a fellowship a couple of years ago where the photographer actually made his own camera. So that was very appropriate for him to talk about the making of the camera, because that's what made the um, fellowship. 
where there's a collaborative presentation, so that means you might have actually um, used a designer or a printer specifically, you must be in control of the decision making for all that. It's got to be your work. You wouldn't apply for a photographic distinction if you hadn't taken any of the photographs or you've never taken the photographs. So, you know, we do, we are aware that people will collaborate, but please do um, say how you've collaborated. So let's go down again. So here we go, licentiate. We'll be looking at this again in a moment, just briefly, but this is what is looked for in licentiate. So it's really still about the camera craft um, and creative technical approaches, visual awareness, communication, presentation. As we go through to associate, here we're still looking for the same skill sets of the licentiate. So we would expect somebody who's applying for an associate to be aware of camera craft skills and see them evidenced. Um, but we're now looking for a body of work that communicates an individual's vision and understanding, a higher level of technical ability, and an appropriate understanding of craft and artistic presentation. Now, if we just go back to that licentiate just for a moment, you can see that the submission must demonstrate competence in both camera work and photo book production. So we're looking for both. And that follows through to associate. And all of that then follows through to fellowship. <clears throat> and this is where we're now looking for a distinctive body of work. Well, what does distinctive mean? There's a little asterisk there. And at the bottom, it says evidence of a distinctive element, such as a developed individual artist's voice. So you're now in control of your camera craft and photo book making. You've developed a project for your you know, associate level project, but now we can actually see that you've created an artistic and individual artist voice, approach to creativity. Maybe you've created new knowledge through your book or developed established knowledge, but it just needs to be something distinctive. So that's the very basic guidance, um, what's being looked for. Um, so let's just go back to here. And just, just before I move, actually, I'm just gonna go back to that just for a moment, because I should have just shown you, that's your application form. So you book it as normal, there's your application form. I think that might actually be about to change. I just want to show you something that might just panic you when you see that. Let me just have a look. Because I think they're just waiting to get it updated. Yeah, when you're booking, when you're booking your assessment, you might not have created your supporting evidence at that stage. And that's just what I wanted to highlight. So if you're booking your assessment and you want to book it ahead to make sure you get a space and you're sat there looking at this thinking, well, I haven't done my supporting evidence yet. Don't worry about it. Just type in here to come or to follow. Um, it just it just confuses a little bit. So there we go. We'll just close, close those and we'll go back to there. So hopefully that helps you. Um, understand the differences and we can we can discuss this more in the uh, question time at the end so yeah we've covered all that basically what i've just said this is the key word whatever you submit make it appropriate make it appropriate so make sure that your supporting evidence is appropriate for the work you've made, the work is appropriate for what you intended to do, and just make it appropriate. And fingers crossed, you'll have every chance then. Three different levels. Now, the big elephant in the room. That's not me, big elephant in the room. What is a photo book? How does it differ from a photo album? And this is something that um, it's, it's quite a big hurdle, really, to take on board. It's not just about slapping 20 pictures in a book like we used to when we used to make photo albums. So some of the things that you might demonstrate in your photo book, so we just push that elephant to one side for a moment, an appropriate narrative, an appropriate concept, appropriate sequencing, appropriate camera craft, appropriate photo book making skills. 
These are all things that as we're looking at the photo book during assessment, we're looking for evidence of what is the narrative that this photographer has created. Narrative, of course, can be the story the book is disseminating, but also how you've created the book. So there's the different ways of demonstrating narrative. The concept is all wrapped up in that. How you sequence, and I'm going to be talking about sequencing in a little bit more detail in a moment, because that sequencing is what creates the flow through the book, the movement, what makes people turn the pages over, and appropriate photo book making skills. Joe, Mary, Anthony, and Richard, have you got anything else that you'd like to add at that point, which um, maybe you would be looking for when you're assessing the books? Any other thoughts? I've, I've got something on definition, if you like, Stuart. I've just got three very quick definitions. And this is from Matt Johnston. And he said the photo book is a series, is a single or multi authored bound work with photography as its primary content. It is an expression of a unified thought, subject, position, location, or time that has been constructed with awareness of the physical book as output. The second one is a series of images that is tightly knit, well edited, organized group or set of images in a linear sequence presented in book form. And the third one is, is a bit lofty, but it says firstly, it should contain great work. Secondly, it should make that work function as a concise world within the book itself. Thirdly, it should have a design that complements what is being dealt with. And finally, it should deal with content that sustains an ongoing interest. And that's from Parr and Badger's photo book. And the, the first book, Richard, was that the um, little A5 portrait one with the black sort of front cover? Yeah, from Matt Johnson, it's just been published, photo books and a critical companion to the contemporary medium. Brilliant. Do you want to just hold that up so people can sort of see that front cover so they know what they're looking for? Can you see that? Yep, we can. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. I think That's it's a, um, I think it's I think it's critical, isn't it, that the that it's not just as you say about the photography, it's that the photographs and the other elements of the book, so that you know the, the structure, your binding, your your text, etc. So all those other elements of materiality, as it were, they complement each other. So the photographs and the materiality of the book, if that's a word, complement, and that there's some kind of theme or narrative or you know idea concept in mind in terms of that kind of creation. And and I'm always sort of thinking in terms of a successful photo, how does it work as an experience for the for the viewer, for the for the audience? Um, in terms of, you know, sort of holding that book and, and you know, that tactile experience that we have with it. Um, is it evoking an emotion for me? How successfully does it sort of fulfill um, the, the intention of the artist or the photographer, really? So that experience is important. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, that's a really good point. And this experience is, is something we can't really stress enough of. And of course, what you can do is you can ask people to look through your book and, and um, measure their experience. You know, ask people who are used to making books, maybe if you can. And of course, that's what we would be looking at during a one-to-one -to, -one to offer you some guidance on how we experience your book, the impact of it. So thank you, Marianne, for that was marvellous. And Joe, anything uh, gets harder as we get on, don't you? Anything else? <laughs> it does, I've got the, the uh, short straw here. Um, I think without repeating what's already said, I think something that may appeal to some people, which is something that I always look for, and that's the surprise or that little element of uniqueness or even a leaf, I think it's the correct wording is a leaf motif where there is something that you, you, um, you identify that crops up occasionally throughout the book that gives it that cohesion, but still with those odd little breaks, the, the break in the rhythm is really important because you don't want every page to be the same. And whether it's the materiality or the style of the layout or just little additions or uh, um, omissions even, um, I think those, those little attention to details can raise a book from being something lovely, but possibly a little uh, predictable to something very, very special. And again, as Marianthe and I said earlier, 
the experience, it becomes enriched by these attentions to detail. Yeah, thank you, Joe. That's that's brilliant. Thank you. You did very well to. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well done, Joe. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, Stuart. My connection dropped out. Then I think I've missed the past few minutes. I uh, I lost the connection for a while. Yeah, we 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 can miss my you, words of wisdom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were very valuable, Marianne. We'll sell them to you later on. I bet they were. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to watch on the recording. Thank you. Yeah. So so you can you can gather now that um, it's about this experience and the experience is part of the concept and the narrative and the sequencing and everything else is all part of all of that. So. Um, there's quite a bit to it, but it's well worth um, pursuing and creating photo books because when you've actually put it all together, wow. Um, one of the things that this experience makes me think of is, is, and some photographers do this with photographs, they don't edit them straight away, they don't rush to edit them. They, they, some photographers even put them to one side for up to a year. Um, and what they're doing is they're getting rid of the experience of creating the work. So when you're trying to disseminate your work to others, you've still got the memory of ex the experience of actually creating it. And that can hold you up. So that's something to bear in mind. Don't rush at making these photo books. So let's just talk for a moment about different elements and the concept um, is vital. It's vital to think about the concept of your book. Um, what is the form and function of your book? Um, why have you even made a photo book? Ask yourself that question. Why am I making a photo book from this project? I've taken some photographs. I want to make a photo book, but why? How many photographs are you going to include and why? That big why question all the time. The edit and the sequence of the book is vital. And I'm just going to talk about sequence in a moment because people do struggle sometimes about sequence and, and they think there is only one way of doing it but there's many ways of creating movement the sequence through the book how much text are you going to have and how are you going to use it and the layout and design all of these things you might talk about in your supporting evidence because um, that's part of your journey to creating that photo book and it, it might well be that when we're looking at the photo book, it's not obvious the journey, and maybe that would be quite an interesting aspect to look at in your supporting evidence. Don't overdo the supporting evidence. Um, make it impactful. Sometimes less is more. So don't hit us with tons because then we could often miss the important aspects of it. I don't know what this red line that suddenly appeared there is. Um, typography is vital. People can get very over fancy with typography. Um, typography is a creative craft of its own. Typography is marvellous, but if you get too fancy with it, um, your reader might not be able to write, read what you've written and it gets lost. So typography is really quite um, important. There's some marvellous, I'll just go to this um, blog here. Um, there's, there's lots and lots of information on typography there, look. So look up typography and understand obviously fonts and how you're using them, the size of them. You don't want too many in your book, otherwise it becomes a little bit gimmicky maybe, unless you're creating a gimmicky book and you'd explain that in your supporting evidence. So here we go, um, a couple of wedding books that um, I've created, I've photographed over 3,000 weddings in my time. Um, I'm pretty much retired from them now, although I am looking at doing some for part of my PhD. But this is where I'm looking at, you know, this 2009 book, which really was just a photo album. Yes, it followed the timeline of the day, but it was really just a set of photographs for the couple and their family. And nobody else is really going to be interested in them. This, this one here, 2014, is where I had a family who were willing to allow me to create more of a sort of social documentary uh, coverage of their wedding. And so it was an English country wedding. And so it says something about what an English country wedding is. I'm not arguing that it's a great book in any way, 
but it just shows the difference between what is just a pure wedding album and a photo book which is starting to have more of a narrative um, to explain something that might be interesting to um, people other than the direct family involved. So what is a photo book and how does it differ from a photo album? This is what we're really talking about now. So sequencing. Um, all books have a first and last page. We know that first and last photograph. Goes in between. I'm just going to mute you for beer. Or can you mute yourself for beer? Um, what goes in between and how are you going to create the sequence that flows smoothly so it doesn't become abrupt unless, like Joe was saying, you want to actually stop the viewer for a moment, just break the rhythm of it. How are you going to get, keep getting them to move? Well, this is just a little project that I'm doing literally at the moment, just in a course I'm teaching. And I've started to create this book from a visit um, that a group of us did from the East Midlands and Central region to the National Memorial Arboretum back in October. It's one that uh, Richard and Robert and myself organised and 21 um, members of the RPS went along and we all took photographs. And it was a marvellous day. And now I want to create this little book. As I say, this is just an example. And I've just started to work on the sequencing. So this is my front page. Um, I've come up with a title. So the title creates almost a feeling of what this book is going to be about. They fought for us, National Memorial Arboretum. I've got some context coming in on page three. And then this is my back page. What goes in between and how am I going to sequence it? Well, I photograph people. That's what I do. I photograph people. So there's always people in my photographs. Um, the landscape interests me. Space, this here, I almost see as a cannon. You know, a cannon on a ship somehow. You've got the torrent and the people walking away almost in like soldiers. And then these two little boys um, sat there on the steps looking over. And, and were they saying they fought for us? So this is the context of the book, the concept, I should say. It's all about looking. And this, this image here, I just noticed, um, you haven't got you, the headless soldier. There's no body. Is that the uniform of a soldier who never came back? Um, so I'm starting now just to sort out the sequence. So we turn over. And actually, in many ways, I think sometimes we our books in this country, because we read left to right, don't we? Um, but as we flick a page, the first picture we see is the right-hand page not the left-hand page. And in newspaper world, the right-hand page was always more expensive to advertise on the right-hand page. And it was always deemed more important because that was the first page that people saw. Well, actually, if you just think about this just for a moment, it's a crazy idea, but actually, if you turned a book over, if you turned a book over and what's on the back page now is the front page and it's hinged on the right-hand side, and now as you open it, the first page you see is the left-hand page now, and then you go to the right. Maybe that would be an easier way for us to do photo books, but we're not going to change that. So it's just a little thought. But what I'm doing here is I'm looking at page five as being the most important because that's the first page we see. And then we look at the left-hand page where we see this gentleman here. And then as we go over to the next, we see him on the right-hand page. And then we go to another group. So can you see how I'm starting this book off with a group of people and then a single person, a single person, a group of per people. Let's just go over and have a look at how that looks as you turn the pages over. Let's open up. We've got Zoom running as well, so it's just proving a little bit slower. So there's our front cover. And as we turn that over, we then see the text first, and then I've dropped this photograph in there. And that's just to, that's almost like the establishing shot. We now know that we're at an arboretum. When I eventually design this um, book properly, there will be a separating page at the beginning. It won't go straight into this page. Um, and then as we flick over, if you look at this figure here, um, that figure is replaced by this figure, and he's looking down at this group as we go to the next two pages 
that's where we have this again. And then my next page is we started to move outside. So I've created almost like four chapters. That's that's the that's all I've done on this book at the moment. But I'm creating four different chapters when we arrived. Uh, three chapters, sorry, when we arrived, um, and what went on then, and then we went out for the memorial service, and then we went and had lunch. The fourth section is the um, establishing images, the pictures of the actual arboretum. So that's one way of creating a flow. Um, let's have a look at some other ways. So. At Bot 21, there was also some marvellous speakers in the Royal Photographic Society um, lecture hall there, and one of them was Matt Stewart. And Matt Stewart, as many of you will know, is a London street photographer. He's a, he's a really good street photographer, produces some fabulous work, and he spoke about how he sequenced his photographs. And of course, he's walking the streets taking images, um, which can prove quite difficult to sequence. Let's have a look through his book and we'll go on to um, Vimeo and let's make that go larger so you can see photobookstore.co.uk is a marvellous um, online and they sell books of course. Now as we flick through and it will flick through very quickly I hope it will work via Zoom for you um, but what you'll notice is that Matt uses colour a lot so as the pages turn over you'll see here we've got red. I would imagine there's some red in the next scene as well. He also chooses images where the main subject of the picture is in a similar place to where the main subject of the previous photograph was. And that's about continuation. All of this is very similar to continuation in television. So let's just flip through that. Let's see how the pictures just go from one to the other, the red post box to the red bus. You see that just flows so smoothly and it's all through colour and placement of main subject. And there's some very clever pairings of images. So let me just pause that and just go back a little bit, see if I can find a couple just to show you. So we've got the pigeon walking along. And let me turn over and we can see the leaf, which looks like lip, a lip on the stonework. If we go back a little bit more, we can just see there's a marvellous one somewhere. We've got the red and the red. I'm not going to, ah, here we go. The gentleman pointing. What's he pointing at? Well, he's pointing at the diving rugby player who is diving to save the child. But of course they're not. That's just what Matt has observed. So, you can't look at enough photo books and when you're looking at them, look for these things that people are using. Now we're going to, is, I don't know, is Fiona with us today? I'm just going to stop sharing to see if I can get rid of that red mark. Hi Stuart, yes I am. Okay, all right. You, you, <clears throat> you'll, you'll go red in a moment because um, as I did to you in the Women of um, women in Photography lecture, there we go. I was looking at a work and I, I've looked at quite a lot of your work, Fiona. I think it's really marvellous. It really is marvellous. So um, this is your uh, one of your books, The Old Farm. And you can see here how Fiona has paired up her images. This is a good way, a really good way to start sequencing your photographs, to start viewing them as pairs. So let's just go onto Fiona's website. And we just make them go a bit bigger. So we can see here how two images, which at first you think, well, why do they go together? Well, we've got the horizontal lines and then the sweeping lines, and we've got the brick wall that you would climb up or the stone wall that you would climb up. And then we've got these um, archways that sort of these metal rungs that go up. Um, really clever pairing of a couple of images. And then we move on to 
this steel, this rusting steel, and then we've got the steel can here, and then the natural poppies, the reds of the poppies work with the red of the rust. And, and obviously Fiona likes rust because here we've got a rusting bit of metal and then the tap where the water would come out of to make the metal rust. So some very, very clever pairings. And here we've got the wooden spade handle propping up some bit of metal and then we've got another bit of wood propping something up. So you see how there's always a subtle little link between the photographs. It's very, very clever. So well done, Fiona. And um, here we've got another one of Fiona's books, and this is part of Ewan's, Ewan's Book Club on the Biblioscapes um, website. And I think, Marianthe, I think, I, uh, I think you mentioned that's on the Women in Photography um, uh, talk. And it's a marvellous collection of photo books. And let's just go to it just for a moment. And here we go. Um, Fiona's uh, full of changing leaves. And let's go down here so we can see. Whoop, whoop. Thank you very much. Pop up. So let's just play through that. And, and here you can see how Fiona is again linked photographs and they just flow from one to the other. See the colours, we're seeing we're going to black and white now. So there's that sort of separating page there um, when we went from colour to black and white. We've now gone back into colour, but it all seems to sort of flow very, very smoothly. The trees and zooming in, which is quite a short book, but a really nice book to you. And then we're coming on to the owner's fellowship book. Now, I'd never met Fiona before. We saw the book at assessment and all the assessors just said, it's so distinctive. Fiona had applied for an associate and we brought in this license we have to offer a higher or lower level. And um, Andy Moore had the pleasure of um, phoning Fiona that evening and saying, would you like to accept a fellowship? And I met Fiona the following day, I think Marianne um, introduced me to her at the Martin Parr Academy, and you can see some little thumbnail pictures there, how excited Fiona was. Um, I didn't react quickly enough, and I can only show these as thumbnails because she was moving so fast, there's a little bit of camera shake. Um, but the enthusiasm, the pleasure. How did it feel, Fiona, to be offered a fellowship? Uh, I was completely speechless, actually, when, when he called. Um, I was overwhelmed. It actually probably took me a couple of weeks to actually sort of um, accept it. I was, up, I was so delighted, just absolutely over the moon. So I still am, actually. So, uh, yeah, no, it was uh, certainly, um, I was certainly very, very happy to accept. Fantastic. Now, I have to say, I, I, I haven't warned anybody here what I was going to ask them, because um, the way I do presentations and lectures is I haven't got a clue what I'm about to say. Um, I'm, I sort of, it comes out as I go along. Fiona, would you be happy to talk us through your book as we go through it um, and talk about your approach to creating it? Would that be possible? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. So let's go back. <laughs> Doesn't like pushing now. me on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, it's something I enjoy. I like the adrenaline rush of doing it to myself. So, um, but I, I'm sorry, I, I should have warned you beforehand. So, yeah, your, your cover is just really beautiful and you made this bo box. And um, what gave you the inspiration to do this? Um, actually, from looking from others, I mean, Marianthe um, to me is, a, is an inspiration, is another um, female artist book lady called Shona Grant. Um, and uh, again, she does beautiful work. So I think I would recommend to people to um, have a look. Ewan's, the Bibliosceps website is a fantastic resource. Um, so you can learn a lot from uh, doing research into photo books and obviously um, having your own ideas. I mean, I, 
I very clearly knew sort of what I wanted to do my book about, which is in the offing. And that in a lot of ways could have drove the colors, the end papers, um, as you can see here. So on the front cover, I had a little insert that was taken um, in Harris. Um, and it had the sort of blues and the, the greens and the whites. And so I spent ages looking for um, an end paper that would, when you open the front cover, would then carry through those colours from the little inlay. Um, and I also wanted something that would be suggestive of the sea, uh, which is why I came up with this end paper that I used. Well, offing, what is offing, Fiona? Yeah, so the offing, you know, when you stand at the coast and, and you look out to sea and where you sort of can't quite tell where the, um, the sea and the sky meet, um, that's the offing and that's where that expression comes from. You hear people say, but oh, something's in the offing and it's that, as it says here, the deep distant stretch of the ocean still visible from the shore. So it's just that line as you look out. Um, that you see in the in the distance in the horizon. Fantastic. And as Joe said earlier, it's this sort of not giving everything away too quickly. It's just making the viewer intrigued and, and thinking about what's coming next. And, and as we turn over the page, we've got sort of kind of in the background a sort of image, but we're still not seeing any photographs other than that one on the front. And now we've got some contextualizing information, which gives us some information about what Fiona is going to show us. And, and now I think we're really keen to actually see the photographs. She's almost like saying as the uh, engagement. But as we turned out, we still haven't seen any pictures. We've got my blurred expectations. So this is really now starting to get us intrigued, I think, I would hope. And then we come on to this, this beautiful picture. Um, do you want to just talk about that just for a moment, please, Fiona? Yeah, I had, um, I very much wanted the book to sort of reflect my emotions that I experience when I'm at the coast. I mean, I, I love being at the sea and at the coast and, and those emotions can be very mixed, as you'll see as we go through. So this one, my expectations are, you know, hopeful and and um, bright and hopefully that's reflected in, in the images that you get in, in this section. But also sometimes when I'm at the coast, you know, you may be feeling a bit darker, you know, you have some fears and whatever. And so, so I very much wanted my book to reflect four of the emotions that I experience when I'm at the sea, which is why I decided to, to structure it and sequence it the way that I have done. So it starts off, um, obviously with these lighter images, which are quite calm, um, with reflecting the lighter colours. That's, that's brilliant. So we've got this emotional response. But what I want people to be aware of as well is the form and function and the creation and how you've designed this book. And, and if we just look at this black line, as we flip over, we've now focused our attention on this line even more. Let's just go back. This line is blue line, we then move over and we've, we've really gone onto this line now. And we've got a little bit of text here. Yeah, um, I love um, sort of words and, and language and that. So for me, when you announced sort of back in the spring last year that um, you were going to create this new photo book genre, I was absolutely delighted because I had been thinking of trying to, to put together a panel, but I was really struggling because how, how could I have a, a coherent, cohesive panel with these sort of different sets of images? And I just couldn't get that to work. So when you announced that you were doing the photo book genre, I thought, God, this is just perfect because it means that I can do what I want to do, you know, with my images and structure, but I can also put text in because for me, words are really important. So. And I spend, you know, I spend a long time reading. I love poetry. Um, so I spent a long time when I was sort of sequencing my book as well, looking for words that were going to match and go with the image and, and, and hopefully also match that emotion as well. Thank you. Let's just flick through some of the pages now, or actually all the pages really. And, and we're kind of seeing this often now replicated on the pages in different ways. There's subtle differences, but each image kind of just keeps our attention somehow. 
And you can see how they're paired together. At one point, you can't start to wonder whether they're the same image divided in two, but they're not. But it's that subtle and it's that cleverly paired up and designed. And then we have a missing page here. No image, I should say, because we've now gone into a black and white image, maybe. Is that why you put that? Um, yeah, there's actually on my website, I've only just put a selection from the book. So this isn't ah. actually the whole book. So right. when you have turned over that double page that, that we looked at, there would have been another single image. Then you turn over again, and then there's just a blank that would be before this would be a blank page, and then it would say my fears. So we've now come into the next section of the book. Um, the emotion then that's in this section is, as I said, my fears. So the images are much darker. Um, and as you see here, I've got you know a, a quote: "I fear what is above the surface, unhidden more than what is beneath it." And that's obviously to try and reflect that image that you have on the right. Brilliant. Fantastic. And, and and again, if we just look at where that image and the text is placed, the text is this sort of subtle um, colour. What, what what tone is that, would you say, Fiona? Is it? It's, uh, um, I picked it up um, to try and sort of pick up the the blue of the cover. So it's it's similar to the cover of the book. It's obviously a bit hard to tell on, on the screen, but if you actually look at the, the real book, that's the shade of the text that I used. Fantastic. And, and what we can see is that the text isn't dominating. It's, it's just there. It's readable. It's very easily readable, but, it, but it's not distracting from the image. The image is still the dominant thing on these two pages and can you see where the line is the line goes into this gap i think these things are really clever um my, my phd is a doctorate in design so photography design how we think how we find solutions for problems is what really intrigues me so let's just move over and then we have this little poem at the end these words um, yes, yeah, so we've now moved into the, the next section. So there were five images in total in there, my fears. And then the next section that you come on to um, is my dreams. Um, yeah. So you'll have turned over the page that says my dreams. And then you have the, um, the poem about the liminal space. Um, and I'm trying to tell a, a particular story in this, in, in the my dreams section, where um, the image before the this sort of pair of images um, is actually just of a, um, I don't know if you remember, it was an orange chair just sitting on the beach, a little orange beach chair. And, and, and sort of the story I'm trying to tell is, is the dream. So I've gone down to the beach and I'm actually waiting for somebody, I'm looking for somebody. Um, so this is the only um, section where there's figures um, in the photographs. So as you can see, um, this this was a this was actually taken down in South Wales at Porth Call, and uh, some innocent lady was on the beach, but she was far enough away. I thought I didn't need to ask if I, if I could take her picture. Yeah, yeah. you probably thought there was something odd if you did, did ask. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful and beautiful tonality there, absolutely stunning, and it gives you a sort of dreamy like uh, feel, doesn't it? And then we come on to this image here. So have we yeah, moved so again? Yes, yeah, so you've now come to the um, the last section in the book, and um, this is my yujen, which is a, a Japanese word, and it, it means that sort of the the sort of the beauty and the happiness, but it's also tinged with a bit of sort of sadness, a bit of melancholy, um, which is what I'm trying to sort of reflect in in the pictures. So the images in this section are dark, but they also have light in them as well. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. And we've got the words at the end. And then a Van Morrison quote um, Coming. to finish. Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. That was just absolutely marvellous and uh, well done on producing. Stuart, can I just come in if that's okay? Of course you can, Jo. Um, first of all, I'd love to say how lovely it is to meet you, Fiona, um, even though it's just on Zoom, because I just felt it was important to say for the people who are watching this evening that we looked at many books 
at the assessment of which, you know, all of them had something really lovely to offer. But I just remember opening the box of your book and for the audience, it's, it's really small in a really beautiful way. And I opened the box and there was just this peace that comes over you. It's a really quiet book and it has, it has a journey in it. And I didn't know what the offing was and it just said a few words, but it said everything. And it's really simple, but it's so beautifully executed that to go through it, it was just an, it was an absolute joy. And, you know, I, I can't tell you just how lovely it was. And, and, and thank you for that experience because it really does sum up everything that's been explained this evening. And uh, it just did everything um, that Stuart has, has laid out. So um, I'm really pleased that this oh, has been included you. this evening. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jill. So, well, I wasn't expecting it to be, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Stuart is specialising in knocking me sideways, so. Uh... <laughs> there, is, there is a kind of a, a theory. Thank you for that, Joe. That was fantastic um, to, um, that was a fantastic um, commentary. Thank you. There is sort of rhyme to my reason, and, and, and that is that, Fiona, we know that you've just said something straight from the heart. You didn't rehearse your answer. It was off the cuff. And I think that makes your response so much more powerful. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, Marianthe and, and Richard, can you, can you remember this book as well? Have you got anything to add to what Joe was just saying? I mean, yeah, I mean, just to sort of reiterate Joe's words, I mean, it was, you know, sort of, you know, just very, very beautiful from the first moment I sort of picked it up and because it's handmade as well. So I have a particular affinity, as you probably um, gathered with, with the handmade. So every thing, I'm very mindful of those, um, you know, attention to detail, the paper, you, the choice of the paper, which obviously we can't see from the presentation, but the tactile nature of any book, but of this particular one, you know, sort of beautiful, soft paper. Also, what's not clear clear from the presentation obviously um just because of how it's displayed on um, on Fiona's website it's um the construction uh, that the format of the the book as it were um is in a leporello concertina um sort of binding so you can actually open out it can be displayed um in two different ways so it, as a page by page as you've sort of shown in the presentation here but it can be opened out so you can see a sequence of more than sort of one or two images and that's you know, it's basically using that kind of structure of a book, a different idea of presentation to um, complement the images. And so we, we could see those um, sort of groups of, you know, four or five images that evoked that, that sort of, you know, the, the happier emotion, then moving to the sad emotion. And you could view all of those in the concertina format. Um, in one sort of set, as it were, which was it's just all of those thought processes that Fiona sort of went through. And I know how much work will have been involved in, you know, every single thought process that probably will have been, you know, sort of several mock-ups, probably yeah. some swearing <laughs> along the way, trial and error. You know, it's a process, a process of kind of you know, a journey of discovery and kind of errors, but errors that lead to um, hopefully, you know, sort of successes and, and something wonderful at the end. And, and it, you know, to, to my mind, it was a brilliantly successful, well thought out, um, beautiful book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That's brilliant. Thank you. And, and Richard, did you have any final words on yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I'd say is that it was actually, I mean, it was something that we've never done before, but it was quite an easy decision, wasn't it, to mm -hmm. <coughs> elevate it. And, and what, what people might not understand is the way that the books were assessed or they the were assessed in October is that we look at the books in the morning, we look at them independently for sort of 20 minutes, half an hour per book, but we're not allowed to discuss it with one another until the afternoon. And I think everyone was quite excited about this, this book when they saw it in the morning. And I had the pleasure of bumping into Fiona. I think I was the first one to bump into her the next day, looking at somebody else's book in the Martin Pars Foundation. And yes, I can confirm that she was indeed excited. Very much so. Very much so. Thank you very much. So you'll often hear, thank you, Richard, Mary Anthony and Joe, and, and a special thank you to Fiona for um, um, talking us through your book. Thank you. You will often hear um, RPS assessors say 
we know it when we see it, when you ask them what makes a fellowship application. What we've just done is kind of contextualized that statement. Everybody knew that this was fellowship as soon as they saw it. So thank you very much for that. Um, so some further, just, just to polish off, um, just where you can pick up some resources and look at books. Uh, we've mentioned Ewan's Photo Club. Um, Ewan basically um, puts on these reports of all his different books. So there are all these, all of these books he's um, purchased, I believe. Um, and what he'll do is, if we just click on this one, I've never clicked on that one before, uncovering Shibura. So you can see there's a regularity to um, what he does. He puts a description underneath of the actual book. So you can really get an idea um, of what people are creating out there. Um, Steve Taylor is one of our East Midlands members and he runs photo titles. Um, he's fanatical on Stephen Gill. He's probably got a bigger collection of Stephen Gill books than Stephen Gill has himself, um, but he's got many, many other titles as well. And um, Stephen, uh, yeah, Steve does a, a similar thing. So if you click on any of the books, he's got a few of the pictures there. He's selling the books, of course. It is a business that he runs, but he describes the book there as well. And um, Steve has been doing this for decades, so he's got a phenomenal collection. Um, there's lots and lots of resources on YouTube and Vimeo and the photographs that I showed you earlier on. The flip through of the book was, was on Vimeo from the photo bookstore. And you can see there's a massive 276 pages. I mean, you could spend your whole month's holidays on looking at books on photo store. And that really is how you're going to develop an awareness of what people are doing out there and what kind of works. I've only given you three links there. There are hundreds. And the RPS at the moment are redeveloping their foyer and there will be a um, little bookstore there and they're connecting with the um, book club. So that will be another resource. So I want to have some time for questions. I can see there's been 18 questions in the chat room so far, and you'll have some questions to ask us. But what we've done tonight is you've met the assessors. We've investigated the RPS website photo book resources. We've looked at the three different distinctions. And I call them three different distinctions rather than three levels because they all engage with something different, licentiate, associate, and fellowship. We've looked at narrative sequencing. We've looked at typography as well. And... We've looked at the first ever photo book genre fellowship awardee, Fiona. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, and I'm going to go over to gallery view. And I'm going to open up the chat line there and just have a look at some of the questions. And if anybody's got any questions they'd like to switch their microphone on and ask, um, I'll then um, invite Joe Marianthi and Richard and myself, and we will try to answer your questions for you. So has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask um, verbally? Yes, Simon. If I may, Stuart. Sorry. Um, Simon there? Yes, Simon. Um, are all the submissions anonymous? Are we allowed to put up the author name on the book, or is that completely anonymous? It, no, you can put your name on your book if you wish, but what will happen before we see the book is the distinction staff will cover that name over. Fine. So, so or yeah. So, in other words, if we if we were to present um, uh, an anonymous volume and then on its return subsequently could uh, tip in uh, a title page with a, an authorship. Yeah, you can do. I mean, you 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 submit whatever you want, Simon. But right. Ben and Simon will ensure that it's anonymous so that when the book is in front of us, of course, somebody on the assessment team is likely to know whose book it is because yeah, they're yeah. one to one for you. And that's why we, we um, although you can have two um, advisories, you know, one to one advisories, sorry, you know, one to ones online, mm -hmm. um, we, we tend to place that with the same person. So mm -hmm. that one member of the team um, who's actually engaged with that book um, so that it is an anonymous assessment. So, yeah, all must so Simon. Thank you. Right, Stuart? Yeah. Um, Stuart, it's David. 
Oh, hello, David. Hello, hello there. Um, question for Richard, if I may. Yeah, of course. Looking at um, your lockdown study of the villages around you, yeah, and the sub subsequent publication and sale of the books arising out of that. Yes. Did you ask permission of the residents that you took photos of to use them in a quasi-commercial sense? It wasn't commercial. Uh, the books were sold. Everybody agreed to be in the book, and the book yeah. was sold at cost. Um, I, I didn't make a penny out of it. In fact, it cost me money. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, but people were given the option of withdrawing from the book if they wanted to, but out of 178 families, nobody did. Right, right. And I think 170 out of 170 families bought the book. So no, it was done with full cooperation. Right, right. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and a question in general about the supporting evidence. Um, I'm thinking of a series of themes based on one particular exercise I undertook. And I would like to support individual themes with individual commentary um, as an introduction to a particular section. Is that regarded as supporting evidence? This is to everybody. Repeat, do you understand? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I, I can write probably, let's say, five pages of supporting evidence as a narrative. Yep. Can I split those five pages to introduce, say, five sections of a photo book? Yeah, so if um, the supporting evidence can be whatever you want it to be, David, um, what we've got in there is a proviso, though, a sort of um, average, that, that um, if you say uh, gave us an 80,000 word dissertation from a PhD thesis, I, I do apologise, we're not going to sit there and read it all. No. We might do, um, but obviously you can imagine that would take forever. So we asked you to do, I think it's a 500 word um, abstract yeah. sort of thing, a summary. So I think the key thing to bear in mind here is um, don't confuse the assessors. Keep it simple. You know, yes, I think what you're suggesting is a really interesting approach to follow, but make sure that it's all appropriate. Don't overdo it. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. In indeed, it does. Yeah, because, you know, we, we do um, we do only have, I mean, so much time. Um, and what you need to do is impact, have an impact on the assessors. And I'm sure that you can do that. But the way you've described it, um, seems to make sense to me. What, what do you think, Richard? And yeah, I'm, I mean, as we've said before, we, effectively, we've got half an hour to look at your book and look at your evidence. Um, and and you, need, you need to focus us on what we're looking at. And it shouldn't, you know, the supporting evidence can be anything. It doesn't have to be a statement of intent. It can just, and, and, and it, it's largely something that, that supports your application that can be done in, in in the time really and that we can understand yeah i think it think it's yeah. key that that mention that you just mentioned there richard about the time that we have you know that re realistically that that you know sort of relatively short period of time that we have and and those sort of um what i'm particularly interested when I'm sort of reading supporting evidence, just that, that almost sort of explanation of your thought processes, you know, what's your concept? What are the, are, are there any particular reasons that you've chosen to use a certain material or a certain binding, you know, a leporello as opposed to a, a soft bound book? You know, why have you chosen a particular format? If that's relevant, if that's relevant to the, you know, the, the book that you've produced. So I'm interested in those thought processes really, which I would, Personally, I'd like to see within the supporting evidence, but that's not something that you'd put within your photo book. You wouldn't be talking about why you'd chosen a particular yeah. font, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, keeping it simple and keeping it brief-ish. Yes. Given yes. the amount of time we have. Does yes. that help? <laughs> oh yes, very much so, yes. And I will help you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Stuart, there's some questions in the in the yep. app that we need to get to really okay i'm just going through those but are there any that stand out for you richard um 
there was one. Yeah, there was one uh, from someone asking about using photos that have been used in the previous successful assessment. You can't use those, can you? Um, no, no. And someone was asking about using some found images, I think, at some point. Uh, and I think you could use found images in, in the project, but you, they'd have, if it was a 20 image book, you'd have to have the found images on top of those, wouldn't you, rather than included in the 20. Yeah, I mean, found images um, could be where, I mean, you've probably seen some of those um, projects recently where somebody's found an image of a landscape, you know, normally an urban landscape from 100 years ago, and then they've gone and re-photographed it as today. So obviously the found image has got a definite purpose there. Um, and they're comparing it. So it's got to be about your photography rather than somebody else's photography, really. And I think that's what um, is being asked there. So yeah, definitely. So um, I think there was a question about licentiate, wasn't there? Um, with the LRPS distinction for photo books, does this differ from the licentiate distinction where a variety of approach and techniques is expected to be shown within the photograph selected? Um, I would say, Sharon, yes, that is the case. So, um, you know, you, you, you're showing your camera craft skills, really, that variety of approach, as it said, on the um, um, criteria. Um, but you could do that within a project if you so desire to create the concept for photo book. So, for example, if your concept um, for the book was yeah. what does a, a street feel like a high street feel like um, in 2022 you could then go down and, and um, investigate or you sorry use your camera craft skills to slow to show motion to show depth of field etc etc um, so yeah the LRPS you are looking for that camera craft skills and you would want to evidence a range of them um, so We've got camera supporting evidence from part of the. Um, we've got a dog joining in. Is that a question that the dog is answering? <laughs> um, can the supporting evidence form part of the text within the book or should it be separate? Well, it really depends on what the book is about, really, Mike. I mean, um, what sort of. Mike, are you there? What sort of supporting evidence were you considering there? I think you've, to a certain extent, I think you've actually answered the question. With, with, um, uh, I think it was David's um, question. And some of it, I think, and hearing what you and Marianthe has just said, uh, I think in that, I think it sort of, I, uh, the explanation of the concept, I think, from what I'm thinking of anyway, fits in the book. But the, con the explanation of why choosing the format for the book, typeface, etc., sits outside of the book. Yeah. If that yeah. makes yeah. yeah, makes sense yeah. in my head now. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank I mean, you. It is really what you know. What would you expect to see in a photo book? I mean, one of my current favourite photo books is. Um, American Geographies by Matt Black. It's just the most amazing book. Um, Matt Black is a magnum photographer. He's walked or travelled, I should say, travelled 10,000 miles around America, photographing social documentary work, and also um, watching the Magnum Learn, Matt, uh, Matt Black, Matt Black um, programme, and there he's contextualising the book. And so almost you could say, I mean, it's not because it's, it's sort of eight hours of videos, but they, he is giving supporting evidence of yeah. why he created national um, American geographies. I wouldn't want to read all of that in the book, though. <laughs> in the video. Yeah. So it's that sort of balance, isn't it? So, but yeah, very good question, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. There's a couple of questions here from, um, I'm just looking, yes, from uh, David and uh, Alan in particular about handmade vers versus commercially printed books, as well as um, 
can other people make the handmade books? Just to kick off the answer to that, I think you've got to have a perchant, is that the right word, perchant, to actually want to make a book yourself. And uh, it requires um, a few learning skills, et cetera, to, to get it absolutely right. Um, but you have complete control over it. But on the other hand, a commercially printed book, you do have to be aware that somebody else is printing this. And if you go down the blurb route, which is that sort of book is, is very common, you do need to spend the money getting um, test ones made, prototypes, as you would do a handmade book, of course, but you can't control the color it is worth with blurb for example is getting their paper samples they send you um, a set of them so you can feel uh, the different papers of which there are some very nice ones it is worth getting a trade uh, magazine version done as a form of uh, sequencing to show somebody for their um, help maybe or or to um, ask your friends um, and there are other companies that do print uh, in unique, more unique ways. You saw in Mariantha's book, Mariantha's book, that it had a, a fold over page so that you could see three pictures together. There are companies that do that. Um, but obviously, if you print it yourself, you're able to do that yourself as well. So they both have their merits and um, they have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, so. I think other people on the panel may want to add to to these um, questions. Joe, Joe, can you just can I ask you if you can just say what you said again about trade magazine? I didn't quite catch that. You said something about with um, blurb. You can uh, design a magazine with them on their premium paper, which is not a book, as in their square hardback etc yeah, 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 yeah. magazine but you can also buy a really low quality uh like trade trade one i think they do actually call it a trade one and okay. it's very very cheap paper and you're not going to be using that as a color control um specimen it's more about seeing the sequencing and the layout okay. i understand now yeah thank you thank you yeah thank you for your answer joe but, but just to i i'm not <laughs> I'm not a handmade book person. I I use commercial printers, and there's no reason why you can't pass using a commercial book. Exactly. You know, it's yeah. perfectly possible to to pass using a commercial. It's, book. A, it's a, just a different it way a of different, yeah. it. It has a different yeah. feel. It said it yes, but also the person said, "Is it okay to get somebody else to make the book?" I'm just looking. To see where that is with the handmade books do i have to make them or can i engage others under my direction to do so i think it's about the the photographer making that book i i, I think so too i think so too joe i mean you you probably wouldn't apply um to get a distinction using one of the other genres in photography if you hadn't taken the photographs yeah so, um i think probably and we haven't to be fair we haven't actually been fully tested on this yet we haven't had somebody try to um mm. put through a book made by somebody else <clears throat> i but just I, I just wonder what the difference is between getting a company to print the book or getting an individual to make the book i guess the difference is either way you're it. getting somebody else to do the actual uh. book making aren't you yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, the difference is that to actually get a company to print a book, they've invested the £10 million in the equipment and what have you. So it would be beyond um, the RPS to expect somebody to buy a printing press to make it. Um, whereas... But also you're providing the files and whatever your colour spectrum is, for example, or your sizing or your layout is only being produced by them in their machinery. So you have dictated. Oh, 
I think what Joe was saying was that, yeah, so you you have created the design, you've created the PDF, you've used something like InDesign or, or um, Affinity Publisher to design. Sorry, that's book. very dramatic. Sorry. <laughs> She's back. <laughs> I, was, I was keeping the room going while you were... <laughs> you so, solved yeah. the problem. I think that's probably the difference. Does that answer your question, Helen? Yeah, no, it does. That's fine. I mean, I wasn't thinking about making a book anyway, but it's no. just in relation yes. to what the other person was saying when they were asking the question. Oh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because I just don't, I don't think we thought of that, had we, in terms of somebody making, hand making a book on behalf of somebody else. I, I think people who've got the skills to, um, to sort of, you know, to hand make a book necessarily would be bringing a lot of other skills as well into that process. So you wouldn't mm. just be asking someone to, you know, print out the pages and bind them up for you. You'd probably be getting all sorts of other advice and it would be a real collaboration collaboration and then maybe it wouldn't necessarily be sort of your own work that you'd be presenting so I think it's a more complicated relationship maybe yeah. between yeah. yourself and anyone who's making a handmade book for you but just on the subject of if, if anyone is interested in the handmade I know that um, I don't know where to start but you're really keen and obviously sort of courses um, in terms of in person are still yeah, there are Mary Anthony, there are lots of courses what we don't do from distinctions is recommend you go on specific courses, right. um, but there are lots of courses out there in handmade books and it's well worth going on some of them. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we don't currently recommend any specific courses. Um, um, that, that you can go on. Is, is that where you were coming, heading towards? I was just saying, because there was something on the RPS website, yeah. whether I would, whether, whether you were allowed to mention it, something within the, your own sort of um, organisation. Yeah. Yeah, but that's what, that's what I was going to mention. So maybe people might want to search on there. But yeah, well yeah there's, there, are, there are others out there, but the RPS, given the, the interest that there has been, have, have uh, put something online. Yeah. The, the, the reason why we don't recommend specific courses is we haven't yet designed a course that engages with everything that you might need for a distinction success. Um, success. So we, we would hate to um, mislead anybody, um, but there are some marvellous courses and, and um, yeah, do have a look for those. That's, the, that's how you learn all these skills. Um, the one-to-ones, of course, are all um, delivered by assessors. So they know the current criteria. So they're well worth um, looking at. And John's asked about mentor. We don't do mentoring as such, um, but the one-to-ones, that's where we can review your ideas, John. And we've had an avalanche of demand for those. So we, we didn't want to carry on taking people's bookings and then not be able to speak to them for a number of weeks. So at the moment, they've just closed applications for photo book one-to-ones, but they will open again ASAP. Um, so where did panel, where did the panel learn to make books? Well, that would be on these courses that we're talking about. Robert, there are lots of them out there. Just put in handmade courses, handmade book courses. Um, what is the panel's view? Reference handmade books versus commercial printed books. Well, that's really down to um the applicant really what are you interested in um is it handmade or is it printed books they are completely different skill sets really um so it's what you're interested in that's more appropriate there how much text would be appropriate um if there is a lot of contextual explanation information within the book is that a disadvantage yeah it could well be um helena it really depends on what you're doing i mean some of my favorite photo books are by um, um, an author who created an article on a village and there's quite a bit of text in there but the photographs are amazing as well. Um, I'm just speeding through because I know we said we were going to finish at half past eight and we just there's lots of questions here we want to look at how do you choose which company to use to print your book. Um, again that is a minefield Helen. Do some testing. Um, do some testing. That's that's the answer there. Um, it, it's kind of like, what's the best camera to use? Well, sometimes you'll just try different cameras, won't you, and experiment with different cameras. Um, or the one you could afford. Or the one yeah. you could afford. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, there's some 
book printing companies out there who are printing for very low cost, very low cost. Um, yeah, so some excellent questions. What I will do is I'm going to save the questions and just try and go through them. If there's anything specific, I will let you know when I send you a link to the actual um, recording. So I'm just looking through them very quickly. What's the difference between supporting evidence and statement of intent? Isn't statement of intent a summary of evidence? Yeah, a statement of intent is limited to 150 words in any genre other than contemporary, says she. Um, and then in contemporary, you're allowed 300. Um, but <clears throat> we wanted to experiment with just opening the door to whatever supporting evidence you felt was appropriate. Um, and I think it would be very difficult to um, describe your whole journey of your photo book in 150 words. So that's the difference. It's the amount that you're being offered. Or, or invited to include. Um, Michael Perry needs to be a physical book. Yeah, um, it does really, Michael. Uh, um, oh, sorry, Richard is answering Michael. Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, so thank you, Mike. Richard, you've already answered that one. So yeah, it does really need to be a physical book. Um, and the reason why is because we need to be able to have that experience as we've spoken about. It's very difficult to get that sort of same experience from, from a flat PDF or even a turning page. So I think we probably, how long would I wait to get a one-to-one, -one, do you think? Well, um, what we're doing is we're rapidly um, arranging the um, avalanche of demand. It's a little bit like um, if you wanted to go and have a meal at a restaurant um, and there was only 40 covers in there, and when you arrived at the door outside, there was 500 people waiting, you, you, you would get a little bit, um, um, you wouldn't be very happy. And that's a similar situation to what we've got at the moment, really. It's not 500, by the way, but, um, you know, we, we, we're trying to manage them as rapidly as we can. What about titles? How did people come up with their titles? Um, that's a really good question, um, Alicia. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. I'm just going to very briefly share my screen again, just to give you an idea on that. So let me just go to share screen. And um, this is how Matt Stewart um, came up with his title, All That Life Can Afford. He went to look at a statement by Samuel Johnson from 1777. Why, sir, you find no man at all intellectual who is willing to leave London. No, sir, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life, for there is in London all that life can afford. Now, obviously, Matt Stewart is creating his street photography in London. So, obviously, he just felt that that was a very appropriate title for his book. So, um, you can get the titles from lots of different places, in other words. So, um, We've, we've gone a little bit over time, um, 8.40, but is there any other questions that anybody would like to ask before we close the meeting? There's just a quick one from David about page numbers. And, and I think the answer to that is, David, some books need page numbers and some books don't. And it's up to you to decide whether it's appropriate, what size, where they are, or if you don't have any at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got one, actually, Stuart, if that's OK. okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I did put it into the chat, but you, you may, yeah, <laughs> you may have thought it was a bit fine. too long. Um, and Richard may have touched on it, but I'm not sure when he mentioned found images. Uh, I'm in the middle of a project at the moment. I've done a lot of research. I've got um, military records of a particular soldier who the project is based upon. Mm. Uh, I've got some newspaper articles and two very poor newspaper images of this guy. Uh, and it's tracing his final journey from home to the front where he was subsequently uh, killed in action. Is it OK to use those things in the book? Yes. Yeah, so are you, are you referring to in copyright issues, Tony? Well... <sighs> Yeah, I guess, uh, but they're 100, 105 years old this year. No, it's yeah. fine then. Yeah, I mean, my, my, as Richard's just said, my instinct would be that it's fine. If there was anything that you were particularly concerned about, 
Um, I would tend to refer that question to Michael Richard, who is the expert on um, these things. But ultimately, um, although we would always hope um, that you're, you would be willing to share your submission, um, if you were producing a book which was very um, personal and you just wanted it for um, a distinction purposes, you could always talk to Andy Moore and say, what is the situation? This is my book. Um, you know, this is what I'm doing. Can I have it assessed? But I don't want it published um, because of AYZ. But I don't think you've got any issues there. Um, it's a long, long time ago. And presumably you're not going to do anything um, that's going to offend anybody or whatever. Um, right. So it's, it's found images. You're reappropriating. Look, look at orphan images. Um, the, the, and you're doing it for an educational purpose as well in many ways. Mm. Um, the commercial aspect is where it gets sticky, where if you were to photograph somebody drinking, the literal one is where you photograph somebody in the street drinking a can of Coca-Cola, um, and then that was used to advertise something else, then Coca-Cola, they get very yeah. fucked about it. So it's commercial, it's really the um, difficult one. But yeah, really good question, and I'm sorry we missed it in the uh, as we were flicking through all the uh, questions. So. No problem. I managed to get a quick sip of beer in while you uh, <laughs> were discussing okay. the others. Cheers. Thank you. Brilliant. So, any other questions at all? Just had one very quick one. Yep. Which was in uh, early in the chat. It, it's scrolled up now, so I can't see it. But I was asking, is the, I understand that the creative um, presentation of the book is entirely up to the person applying, but is there any prejudice against using photographs that you printed out and mounted onto book paper versus actually printing the whole page? No, I don't think so. No? No, no. Just rephrase the question, Louis. Oh, sorry, it was just, um, I have made some books in the past where I've I've printed my own pictures out and then cut them up and stuck them onto a, oh, right. no, onto not a page rather than, no? yes. No, no, not at all. Um, do, do you know, I, I, I mean, I think you bought a copy of this book as well, didn't you, Richard? Um, Giacomo. What's Giacomo's yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Giacomo, I, I mean, there's a, I interviewed him for the East Midlands. It's on the um, website. Uh, if you go to the East Midlands page, you'll find Giacomo. He produces his photography in a really special way. He goes out with a 1961 camera using film, the camera he'd been given to by his father, he, he doesn't, he's not too worried whether the image is sharp or not. Um, he overexposes, he overdevelops the film because he wants it to be on the enlarger for a long time. He gets these really deep blacks. He was interviewed by Black and White magazine. The book arrived, my only gripe about it is it's so, it's so beautiful that I, I didn't put it on my bookshelf without the cover on it. I don't want to damage it. But the reason why I'm mentioning it was when you open it up, you think they're postcards stuck on the page. Did you think that, Richard? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're not. They're actually part of the page in this instance, but they've been spot varnished to make them stand out for the page. It's beautiful. So if you were sticking your photographs on a page and it looked so appropriate and so distinctive, why not? Why not? Thank you very much. Yeah, well done. Thank you. So there's one new message there. Any other quick questions before we call it a day? No. Well, I'd really like to thank Joe and Richard and Marianthi for joining me for tonight and all of you as well. It's been great to have you online. Thank you ever so much. I'd really like to thank Fiona for talking about her book. David, I've just seen your hand go up. Is that to ask a question before we finish? No, I think I was reaching for my mouth. <laughs> uh, no, that's fine, David. It's David Wilkinson, but it, it was... Oh, sorry. Uh, it's okay. It just spotted, it just cropped up. So thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, I really hope you carry on and develop some fantastic books and we'd love to see them at the Royal Photographic Society. So thank you ever so much. And um, I think Richard, Joe and Marianthe, unless you've got anything to add, um, we'll, we'll call it an evening. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thanks, right. everyone. Safe journey home. <laughs> <laughs> now for a long journey into the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> thanks Stuart thank, 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 thank you thank you Alicia thanks Stuart right thank you fantastic I suppose let everybody leave yeah just save that chat before we is it okay if I um if I go I've got I've got to make a really important phone call is that all right I was going to get you to make the coffee, but yeah, of course, oh, thank, thank you ever so much. Oh, <laughs> you go. Right. Well, I'm going to finish the meeting you. now and um, we'll catch up later, everybody, if that's okay. Thank Thanks you. so much. Lovely to see you all. Great Likewise. evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.